Happy Bar. Um, just to give a brief, a brief background of, of Carol, if it's okay, Carol, is Chairman and, and Chief Executive Officer of Vibron Medical and uh, Vibron of America, based out of Germany. It's one of the largest um, and most uh, respected uh, medical device companies in the world, privately held. Member of the global management team of Vibron, uh, uh, the Muslim group um, out of Germany. Uh, so you've been at Vibron for a little over 25 years. Uh, 1991 was elected to the management board and appointed general counsel. Um, prior to that, you served as, as the head of legal, security, and environmental matters department. You began in 1988 serving as a legal assistant to the chairman of the board, and that's where your career started at uh, B. Braun. Uh, you're also the chairman of the German American Chamber of Commerce out of New York, uh, member of the board of directors for um, uh, AVMED, which is the Industry Association for Medical um, Manufacturers in the U.S., and then on the, currently on the President's Advisory Council of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Board of Trustees for Drexel College of Medicine. Uh, Carol was born in New Jersey. He's a German and an American citizen, completed his schooling in the U.S. and Germany, earned a German law degree from the Albert Ludwig University in Freiburg, Germany, and a Master's of Law from uh, Georgetown, Georgetown. So he's a Hoya at heart, I guess, in some way. So yes, I welcome, from. welcome, welcome. Thank you. So the evening today, we're going to spend some time, Carol and I are going to talk through a little bit about his journey, a little bit about what it's like to be a CEO in his industry, a little bit about the changes in the medical industry, and then we'll have a chance to spend some time with some Q&A for the audience, which I think will be a good opportunity to, uh, to get some, some good ideas out. So before we start, would it be good for you to introduce some, I know some of your team is here with you. Would you mind yeah. introducing some of your and team? You asked me to do that so that you know afterwards, if you want to approach some of our teams and ask them some questions, uh, everybody asking me something will probably be too tight. But uh, so we brought some other executives with me this evening. And if you guys just raise your hand or stand up. Rob, are you here? Rob Albert, here's our chief marketing officer, senior vice president. Jeff, uh, Joe Grispo next to him, that's our chief sales officer, also senior VP. Then the one and only chief financial officer of Bebron Medical and Bebron of America, Mr. Bruce Hugel, who started uh, the relationship with the sales. Uh, then Rex Boland, uh, our plant manager for one of our largest plants, was supposed to be here. His wife called him on the way and told him that they've got water in the basement. And I said, that's okay, turn around, Rex. Uh, so uh, that's, my, that's my soft hearted spot, spot that you'll hear about this evening. Then Pedro Menendez. Pedro, where are you? He's an HR man in the factory that is run by Rex. Dave Middle, corporate vice president, he's uh, with our interventional team. Connie Murray, where are you, Connie? Connie's in our educational department. You wanted to understand that, ask her, director of clinical uh, education. Sharon Post, we've got a lawyer with us. She's our chief compliance officer. She does our compliance stuff, which has become so important in uh, ne America nowadays. And Mark Pezzavetto, the heart of Be Broad. There he is. Mark's also, by the way, he's done very many things in our company, but he's a director of labor relations, but he is also a nurse. He just finished. When did you graduate, Mark? 2010. 2010, uh, Mark graduated and became a nurse. So that's the team. <laughs> is my mic not on? No, my mic's not on. You hear me now better, I assume. You heard me anyway, did you? I told you my, my voice will carry this. There you go. I know what. I know what. The relationship with the sales for uh, you guys is, is pretty important. Do you mind walking through the, the special relationship that you Ron has with well, us? Obviously, is, is, uh, well, first of all, I'm a big admirer of Father Gambit. That starts off. Yes. Father Connor. Those are two people that I personally admire. It's easy to work with them. But uh, we are, of course, one of the top 10 medical device manufacturers in the world. We're also a pharmaceutical company. And uh, when the uh, nursing institution here was built, uh, that was obviously an opportun a natural opportunity to work together. And uh, Rob Albert and Joe Grispo and Bruce Hubel took that opportunity to start working closely with the nursing school. Uh, and uh, that's how it started. In the meantime, when you go up in the nursing education center, You'll see a lot of Bebron stuff. You'll see our name there. You'll see Esculap, which is a Bebron uh, company, which is our surgical uh, surgical division. Uh, you'll see our pumps here. You'll see our instruments uh, in the cadaver lab, uh, and uh, much more things here. You will also see uh, volunteers from us uh, per performing here in your classes Absolutely. and and volunteering uh, here. So there are many ways that we work together, and uh, it's a great relationship, and it goes both ways. Great. Now, you, you conveyed a really good story around the first time you talked to Father Gambit and one of the bigger mistakes that you've made. 
And you want to share that with the folks? That's nice, Steve. Sorry. <laughs> start with one of my mistakes. Start with one of my mistakes. Absolutely. And uh, I'll be we glad got to make you look human. I'll, I'll be glad to share that with you. So uh, we had made a donation to uh, one of the major institutions here in uh, the Valley. I'm not going to name it by name. Uh, and we normally didn't do capital contributions, helping with a building or that kind. We didn't do that. And we volunteered to do that. They broke my heart once, and our team decided we we're going to go ahead. And that institution, two years later, had forgotten that in uh, exchange for that money, there was supposed to be a certain educational room named after the Braun. Well, they only, they only made, made half the building because the president had left right after we made the donation. They cut down the whole investment project, and there was nothing nef left for B1 to put their sign on. And I was very upset about that. That was about a week before Father O'Connor and Father Gambit were scheduled to come over and visit me. And they came over, and, and still under this impression, and quite aggravated, and after that, I, experience, I said, that was the last capital investment B. Braun is ever going to make in this country. So, so they come, Father Connor is there at first with some others, and uh, Father Gambit uh, nearly had an accident, he came a little bit later, and they tell me what they want to do with the Gambit Center. And I said, uh, sorry gentlemen, B. Braun does no capital investments, we cannot partner with you on this. Ouch. Out of emotions, and just being mad a week ago, I had made one of the worst decisions that I could have made. God bless they were repaired by my staff, who once, when they saw the Gambit Center, said this is a natural partnership uh, that we have to work up to. And uh, behind my back, turned my decision around and told me and taught me what was the right thing to do. So there you go. We're starting off with a confession. <laughs> I feel like I'm for it. Um, would you mind giving a few minutes overview of B. Braun's a big company. You have lots of lines of business. Would you mind walking through at a high level your core lines of business and what your footprint looks like? To well, kind of give everyone starting story. off with some numbers. Eight billion in revenue mm -hmm. worldwide with 55,000 employees. We have operations in 60 different countries. The company started 175 years ago uh, out of a little pharmacy. And in the meantime, is one of the major medical device manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies in the world with that. And it still belongs in the sixth generation to the same family. Uh, so closely held, I know all my shareholders. Uh, when it comes to a product range, there's probably only one company, probably two now, that have uh, as broad as product range as we do, and one is Johnson & Johnson. And now after Medtronic bought Covidian, the new Medtronic. Uh, so we have an extreme broad product range just because it's grown and grown and grown over all our history. We're not a 20 or 30 year, uh, year company. We started in all kinds of segments. So we have an extremely broad product range which starts from needles and syringes uh, that goes over to sutures, uh, surgical instruments, orthopedic implants, uh, IV solutions, IV uh, connectors dialysis machines, IV pumps, and I could go on for a half an hour and time would just go by and I've got this all behind me and all I did is tell you how many products we have. It, to give you a feeling, we work with every material you can think about. We work with metal, we work with plastic, we work with fluids, we work with electronics. We have just about everything you can think about. It's a very complex organization that has a lot of know-how in many, many areas. Walk me through the changing context of what's going on with the medical industry. Affordable Care Act, the changes in reimbursement. So you, your world around you is changing a little bit. How does that how does it impact you folks? Well, first of all, it starts that of course healthcare costs are a major part of any gross domestic product. There's no nation that it doesn't make a material part of the economy. Here in the United States, 17%, Germany, for example, 11%. So of course it's important, and it's growing at the moment at an unsustainable rate. So everybody's trying to do something about it. Uh, everybody's trying to regulate it. So we have regulators on all kinds of sides, be it CMS from payment, be it the FDA from approval, be it safety, uh, all kinds of, uh, um, the IRS of course, all kinds of ways that people and government is grabbing into our business and trying to control it, which makes it a not so easy environment to, to navigate. You incubated me at lunch uh, with extreme passion this, this uh, 
mission that you folks have around saving lives. And it was highly compelling. Could you share with the audience that, that sense around the purpose? The first thing that you do when you become a Be a Grand employee is you watch a video. In this video are employees of ours telling how our products have impacted them. One of those is a lady who lost her baby, but due to our products was able to enjoy this child for two years, which otherwise would have died immediately. You have somebody whose mothers we've saved, somebody who got saved themselves. What is that all about? We save lives. We relieve people from pain. We make sure that people don't get sick after all, by vaccinations, for example. But everybody has to understand that on the end of our product, there's a patient and there's a life that they're responsible for. So we're passionate about what we do. I don't know how it is to make landmines or tanks, but to make medical products and products that do good things for people is something you feel good about every day when you get up. But there, with that comes a responsibility, and that's what we try to convey to everybody. Great job. Great products, great company, great things that we do. Uh, but we have to do it well, otherwise we can hurt people. The natural extension of that was a discussion we had around this notion of taking it personally, and this notion of doing the right thing, and your ethical stance, and how important that is to, your, to how you lead to your executive team, and then how you do business globally. Can you walk us through that a little bit? Here, a lot of segments to that one. I've got, to, I've got to try to stay focused. First of all, when it comes to a leadership perspective, don't ask any, anybody to do anything that you wouldn't do. Uh, and don't ask anybody to work harder than you do. And don't ask anybody to put more emphasis and more uh, power and energy in that you do. If you don't lead by example, you can't ask others to do it. I, I truly believe in that concept. And uh, that doesn't only mean that your car is the first one to arrive and the last one to leave. It's more than that. It's much more than that. And uh, I hope that my folks here would, uh, would agree that I try to do that. I might not exceed all the time, but I surely try to do that. When it comes to ethics, anything unethical will catch up to you at some point in time. We have at Bron a absolute standard that the family has given uh, when I was in the organization long before. There is no such thing as unethical behavior. If it smells bad, if it sounds bad, if it walks bad, it's bad. Don't do it. We do not participate in any country that is corrupting. We'd rather not do business than do business in a company <coughs> where corruption is part of the business model. Even if it's an accepted part of the business model, Bebron stays away from those and has always stayed away. That's probably part of our 175 year uh, success story uh, that we do not participate in corrupted firms. That's a part of the ethical standards. And it pays back because ultimately the good guy wins. And that's not only in movies. It's really that way. The good guy wins and ultimately the bad guy loses. That's such a true statement uh, that I've seen in the corporate world over the last 28 years that I've been active in it. So the impact on your market position because of your ethical stance seems to be a pretty significant part of how you go to market that your, your um, customers see you as that? I would think, yes, absolutely. Uh, there are certain business practices that are dis being discontinued in our industry uh, that uh, are borderline when it comes to convincing your customers to buy products uh, and, uh, and engaging them in, in working with you. Uh, we've refrained from those practices forever and uh, will never, in our our customers know that that's the way it is. That's how you, the way you work with B-Rock. How do you make sure that that's part of the culture? What do you do to ensure that that's sustainable? Well, you, first of all, you preach it. If there's any violations, you prosecute them. But I have never actually really had to do that during my career here in the United States. And it's, again, setting the example. We don't give them the opportunity, our employees, to do that. And they wouldn't seek for that opportunity because well, first of all, our chief compliance officer will take care of them. Sharon is kind of a very aggressive person, as you can see. Um, but uh, we, would, uh, we would, I think everybody understands it would have consequences if they violate these basic rules of dealing ethically in everything we do. We talked about innovation 
of being really, really critical to your market position and sustainability long term in terms of your strategy. Walk me through how critical that is to you folks and why. Well, innovation in the medical device industry is what all the physicians and the nurses and practitioners are all looking for. They want to do better medicine tomorrow. And they all know that we've made great progress. I mean, if you look at it, heart attacks have gone back by 50% in the last 20 years. Life expectancy has more than doubled uh, since the beginning of this century. Uh, those might not be exact the right figures, but they're kind of in, in, in the ballpark. This is an industry that lives from innovation, but also lives from innovation expectancy among the users. And that is very important. If you just make Me Too project, products and jump behind the others, you will not be the successful company that the physician will let come through the door or the practitioner of any art will let, through the, uh, let you come through the door. Uh, it also is the repayment of your R&D work. Uh, if you have research and development, it's expensive. Getting a product approved is expensive. Uh, if you don't have innovative products enough to bring up these kind of funds, your, cult your company ultimately will not survive. Do you set aside, you don't need to share specific figures, but is there a specific amount of uh, funds every year that you earmark towards, this goes right towards innovation, we're driving it? Innovation has so many different factors to it, but just for product innovation, right, right. Uh, we have about 5% of our total budget of, of the $8 billion. It goes every year directly on costs. But we also capitalize innovation uh, when we're developing new products and new machines. But, and it's not always just products. We also, for example, are very innovative in machines. And so that not everybody can just come out and copy our products by buying machines that somebody else makes. We make a lot more machines ourselves. We had bad experiences. We put in a, a blow fuel seal in the pharmaceutical industry, and uh, we bought it from one company, and it was a real competitive advantage. But after our exclusivity expired after four years, everybody could buy those machines, and we lost that exclusivity. So we've decided in many of our key areas, product areas, to build our machines ourselves <coughs> so that nobody can buy them from anybody else, and we have that competitiveness and uh, innovativeness stays with us. For so instead of outsourcing overseas t to lose control of potentially what may be getting out there in terms of uh, differentiation, you're going to maybe take a little bit of extra cost, keep that inside, and keep the quality high, and keep innovation in-house. And keep it secret, yes. not available to everybody who could just immediately go out and buy a machine and from somebody who makes the machines and copy our products. Mm -hmm. So that's also a part of innovative. And by the way, these machines are so sophisticated with all kinds of uh, sensors and uh, optical uh, um, testing uh, that we really, the cool products. It's really cool to see how safe these products are when they come out. And that is a certain expertise that we also have, which is also innovative. Our customers are impressed when you come into our factories. And we love and do have uh, a lot of customers in our factories. They're very impressed when they go out and see the safety that we build in to our products by the processes we use. This notion of client intimacy, driving innovation, being really, really close with your customers and, and how they use your products, that struck me as a, as a core source for innovation for you. Can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, the, the customers and working closely with the customers is extremely important in our industry. First of all, a lot of the innovations come from physicians, nurses, and other healthcare practitioners. A lot of the ideas. We can talk about that later, that there's things done by the government currently that are poisoning those waters, and we've got to watch out that that, 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 uh, that, that doesn't happen. Because I would say that over half of the innovations that we implement in the medical device industry are uh, initiated by physicians and, and healthcare practitioners. Uh, but otherwise, we also have to train nurses and, and, and physicians uh, on our products. Training is, uh, Connie was here, clinical uh, training, right, is very important. If we do not train these practitioners correctly on our products, they might not do well with them. They might not do what was intended, and harm can be part of the uh, end process. Uh, so working with, con convincing them to use our product is one. Training them to use our product is another. Working with them to improve our products is another. 
working with them to give us new ideas for new products is another. So there are so many segments where we work with healthcare practitioners together, which are extremely important for our company and our industry. So the way you listen to your customers, the type of relationship you have, is certainly a, a stable market, market advantage. Key opinion leader is, and working with key opinion leaders is key in our business, and KOLs as we call them, uh, is uh, on everybody's tongue in our industry and in our yeah, company. Yeah. On your website, it talks about culture, and it mentions three things specifically, driving innovation, increasing efficiency, and sustainability. Do you want to share that with us a little bit? Well, first of all, sustainability. If you're 175 years in the business, the concept of sustainability is kind of natural to you. Uh, if you don't understand that sustainability is a concept that you have to follow, you probably won't be in the business 175 years. And that's ethics, and that's cultures, and that is being economically uh, reasonable in what you do. It's not wasting, it's being effective, and it's being efficient. It's also been great in hiring good people uh, to work and run the company. You need a lot of good minds. You have to make sure that they work well together. Taking care of your employees and making them feel good where they are is a major part of sustainability. Never forget, the most important part of your company are the people that work for it. There's no doubt about it. If you ever forget that, you're going to regret it deeply. So that, as to sustainability, would that be enough? Yeah, yeah. talk to me about increasing efficiencies. Increasing efficiencies is in an environment where cost is going to be a major factor in healthcare, and healthcare is a major factor. 17% growing double digit until the last two years annually was just going to eat up all the GDP this country had. So bringing in efficiency and effectiveness into the system into our manufacturing system so that we can sell our products at reasonable prices. Uh, bringing in the supply chain that uh, we can make sure that we work with hospitals, that they don't need huge inventories and waste money there. There are so many aspects, effectiveness, efficiency, I could go on like that, but I think I get, you've got a little bit of the flavor okay. what is meant with that. Absolutely. You mentioned people, huge part of any organization. Your success is really tied to it. Walk me through the centrality of how important people are to, to be brought in your organization. Well, to, to repeat myself, people are the company. It is what makes the company. Uh, otherwise, the company is buildings, machines, inventories, and uh, a tax number. Uh, everything that makes the company are the people that work for the company. And when you talk about sustainability, if you talk about ethics, it all has to be up here in our minds, and we all have to practice that. I can't emphasize how much. I love working with people. Uh, I love engaging with people. Uh, that is part of the advantage. It's part of the privilege of, in my position to be able to work with so many people. I don't know how much, Steve, more I can just underline that the people make the company and that if you take care of your folks, they will take care of the organization. Uh, and taking care of them just doesn't mean salary, and it just doesn't mean being nice to them and putting in a nice cafeteria. It means training your folks well, giving them the things that they, the computers that they need to, to work well, giving them the communication systems that they need, giving them the opportunities to meet, give them the educational opportunities to meet up and catch up to today's standards in case they're behind. There's so much in taking care of those who you work with and work for. Uh, there's a lot to it, but I hope Good. again you get the flavor. Yeah. You reference that three times a year, give or take, you put your top 30 or 40 leaders together, and you walk through um, focus on strategic objectives as a way to, to one, my words not yours, push it down to the organization, and maybe have some things bubble up that maybe you may not have if you haven't had that experience. Can you walk us through the intent, how that works, and how, you, how that functions within the organization? An organization, size the U.S. is, is one and a half billion dollars in sales, and 15, uh, 5,500 people. So a nice size organization. And all these people can't just walk next to each other, and cannot just sit next to each other. Somehow they have to intertwine. They have to work together. They have to have a common goal. They have to understand how the organization works. Now, how do you do that? Transparency, communication. 
And we have a unique system that we brought, at least maybe it's not that unique, but at least we think it is, and I think it is. Uh, we meet with our top 30, 40 people three times a year. It used to be called our MBO program out of management by objectives, but it's evolved far beyond that. Uh, and now we call it the, our core program. Uh, and, uh, you guys have to help me with the C-O-R-E stands for. I, I still haven't gotten my system. But the concept of this meeting is that each of these executives over two days have 15 to 20 minutes time to report what's going on in their area, what are their goals for that year, and where do they stand towards those goals. Each meeting is, of course, different. The one in the, at, at the end of the year is where are we standing, the one at the beginning of the year, what are we planning. It has a little bit more emphasis, but that the basic is everybody introduces out of their area what they're doing, where they're standing, what are their major objectives. So when these 30, 40 objectives, one meeting has 32 and the other one has 42 meetings, uh, 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 participants, everybody understands what's happening in the other major areas of the company. Nobody can say after that, oh, I had no idea they were working on that. <laughs> At the same time, the executive team up front, at the end, gets the opportunity to explain where we're going and what we're doing. What are the major areas of focus? And we define our own key areas of focus in that meeting. And my final sentence is, if you're not working on one of those, you're probably not working on the right stuff. And it brings everybody together, the way a team should work. And uh, that's what we try to do. And of course, with that knowledge, they can go out and discuss with their teams then what's going on and which areas they would be impacted and which they should look and where should they connect and what should they focus on. Talk to me about your role in that meeting. Because obviously, when a CEO walks into a room in that situation, the, the energy can change. And they can tell you what you want to hear. And a great CEO wants to hear things that they don't want to hear. So walk me through how you ensure that you're, you're getting the right information bubble up. Rumor is, in the B. Braun, that I don't take bad messages well, but that is just a bad rumor. <laughs> is that your perception here? That's that's a, that's a, a, can we triangulate yeah, that a little bit that's with those? That's perception that's about change. But uh, this meeting is, is not much of an exchange. Uh, I do ask questions once in a while, yeah. as do other executives, but it's more to reporting. Uh, that has an interaction in the end, but it's not as interactive as it could be from that perspective that it would be give anybody enough room to, to, to intimidate. It's really putting the goals together and less a give and take discussion meeting because of the comprehensive information we're giving. If there were too much of that, it would probably tear this meeting apart and wouldn't get all the information. Right. So me being in there, first of all, everybody's used to it. I don't think anybody's intimidated in that meeting because it's a format we've been doing now for 15 years. So there's nobody in there kind of, oh my God, the boss is there. And, uh, it's, uh, but there are critical questions. Uh, and there's a, but let's put it this way, I think we laugh more there than we yell, that's for sure. Well, that's, that's no, awesome. we like to laugh at the we do. It's a good thing. Let's shift to you for a second. That's okay. Talk to me a little bit about your the key moments in your journey in your career that really shaped you. The key moments that stick out as being really profound. Well, my career, my career started when I met my wife. Because uh, that, that's when I started to get serious about my education, to be honest. Uh, that, was, that was a fond thing in law school. Uh, when I kind of learned that there might be something serious here that gives me a responsibility beyond just having fun and just being educated uh, for education's sake. Um, with that, um, I found out I wanted to be actually a, a defense attorney. I loved criminal law till I learned the people I had to defend. And I wanted to put them all in jail. I didn't want to defend them. So we found out that I was not qualified to be a, 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 a defender, a public defender. So I switched to uh, international law and that, uh, in, in business law, and that really took me off. Uh, then I learned as a lawyer that talking to a dictating machine all day was just not going to be the rest of my life. It just didn't. I'm too communicative. I had too much fun. So I decided to get out of a law firm and go into management. And I was a very young man at that time, uh, 32, 
and I met George Brown, the owner of the B. Brown Group of Companies. And he was looking for a young man who wanted to be aggressive in his career and grow, climb up the ladder really fast, like he did as a young man. And I remember that day, as I will never forget, when the gentleman, it was an executive search firm, when the gentleman ran out of the room and just hit his hand on the back that pushed the air out of my lungs and said, my God, you did it. That was uh, probably the most changing moment in my life when there was one gentleman, George Brown, who met a young man with no industrial experience and says, I'm going to give you the opportunity, and if you do well in three years, you're going to be on the executive board of a global active firm. And that happened. That's great. You, you talked about your first job hanging drapes in Germany. And for five that was during school. That was during yeah. school. Yeah, I hung uh, drapes, and I did that very well, actually. Yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, I don't do it anymore at home, though. Uh, but uh, that's what I did. I have never, since my 14th year, since I was 14 years, uh, have not had a job. And it was during vacation, and then every afternoon after school, I've been working all my life. That's just what I do. And granted, in college, it was barkeeper, so it wasn't always just hanging drapes. I've done all kinds of things. I've cleaned out cages for dogs. and. Uh, I've uh, ran trucks and loaded and unloaded trucks. I've been a barkeeper. I've hung up uh, curtains. Yep. There are so many jobs I've done, but I've never been without one. And how does that change you, having that, that willingness just to jump in and do anything to get ahead? That, that sense of hard work and sacrifice? I don't... The word sacrifice doesn't fit in that context for me, Steve. Tell me. It wasn't sacrifice. I just enjoyed doing it. Yeah. I enjoyed making money, and I enjoyed being able to afford the things that at least, I couldn't afford everything, but at least afford the things that I wanted to and could afford at that point in time, put some money aside, have a first car. Um, I've always enjoyed doing something. I'm not a guy who can lay back and just watch TV all day. That, uh, God did not give that to me. So where is the drive? You've mentioned that you, you work seven days a week. So where does that, that drive come from? Is it the obligation to the patients? Is it to your employees? Is it just that drive for excellence? Where does that, where does that emerge from? First of all, I enjoy it. That's one thing. I love going to my office in the morning. When I come in and open the door, I feel good. And I truly do. Um, and the reason I work in my office seven days a week, I, I, mm -hmm. I think I mentioned my wife and I have a deal. And we had that right on. I don't work at home. So I've never lived more than 15, 10, 15 minutes at home because I work every day, just about every day. Sometimes I don't work a Saturday or Sunday, and sometimes it's only an hour. But I'm just about seven days a week or at least six days a week in the office. It can't be too far away, though. So why do I do it? There's always something to do. I don't mind doing it. I enjoy doing it. And when I go in on Saturdays and Sundays, no phone, Nobody knocking on the door, nobody disturbing. Those are the times when I take time to read through a longer article. Those are the times when I look, up, look at organizational structures, when I have strategic thinking, where I, my, brain, my brain is just open and undisturbed, and I can let it run uh, for one or two hours without being interrupted. And just really get a chance to focus. And really, think. that's what you do, you particularly on the weekends. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me about, you mentioned you don't take bad news well. Do you believe that's true? Is that accurate? No, that's absolutely accurate. Uh, I'm a very impulsive person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, that is just something that I get easily upset and mad when I get bad news. I calm down relatively fast. Right, Joe, don't smile like that. You're making me feel bad. <laughs> he seems scarred. <laughs> no, but uh, it, it's, some people take it bad easier than others. I'm pretty much calmer about it today than I, I was probably 20 years ago or 15 yeah, years, yeah. but I am truly not somebody who takes bad message as well. So how does your staff around you deal with that? How do they bring things to you that you need to know? Well, first of all, you don't do it in the morning because I'm not a morning person. <laughs> do it when I'm out of energy, a little bit tired. <laughs> Four o'clock in the afternoon, good time to bring me not so good news. <laughs> Uh, I think everybody knows that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, if you don't, you know it now. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but they know it very well. Uh, there's nobody on my executive staff that fears to give me a bad news. Uh, it's just that 
Yeah, well, there's a reaction to it that uh, hopefully is good or better that day. And you need over it real quick and move on. That's to absolutely steps. well. The first thing, first of all, you, your emotions go up, your blood pressure goes up, uh, uh, just is impulsive people react, but then it cools down because now you have a problem to resolve. Yes. And the problem is the major thing that you're going to tackle, not the messenger. Yeah. I'm assuming you're like me a little bit. Is my instinct is always to I want to know what was broken because we can fix it. Without it, knowing, you can't do anything about it. That's and I've, I've said that myself. Just exactly this example. If you don't know what's broken, you can't fix it. You've got to know what's going on, what's not going right, what went wrong. Uh, if you want to get it right, and the faster you know it, the faster you can work on it, the better it is. And there's rarely a situation that bubbles up in business that you, if you find this is a problem that you can't fix in some way. Yeah. So that's when I think of the General Motors examples and they've had the challenges they've had there. It boggles my mind that, that they allow that to, to sit for so long when they had challenges. Is, you know, so how do you ensure that those messages get to you? A, I would hope in, by nurturing a culture of transparency and openness. Yeah. Uh, not being scared uh, to uh, admit a mistake, not being afraid to uh, report a problem, uh, knowing that one thing is we don't have a kill the messenger, we don't have you did something wrong, you're fired, uh, we just don't have that mentality at Ebron anyway. Uh, by, of course, if you fire everybody who did something wrong, uh, if you yell at everybody uh, and uh, in, a, in an insulting way that brings you a bad message, don't expect that you won't hear of the problems you need to know. Because it's going to be shoved under the rug and never going to hear about it again. That, absolutely. Yeah. People dance around you. So it's, it's part of you and how you react to these issues, problems, uh, that uh, will nurture uh, that, hopefully, that culture of being open and transparent about the issues and problems. Do you think that that culture of transparency goes beyond your executive team down throughout the company? I would hope so. Yeah. I mean, if it starts at the top, that kind of thing has to go through. We know, have to know every little problem. Absolutely. It's not only the big problems, accumulation of small problems can lead to a big problem. Uh, and the faster we know it and the easier people can admit to it, the better it should be. Talk to me about decision making. You referenced trans you mentioned um, transparency in the context of decision making at lunch. So walk us through that. How important it is for you to, to walk through that? Through well, first of all, decision making is, first big decision is delegate. If you think you can do everything yourself and smarter than everybody else in your organization, you're wrong. I certainly would be wrong if I'd be on that. I have so much know-how, geniuses, brains, specialists, and special people in our organization who all know ten times more than I do, and certainly in their area, a hundred or a thousand times more than I do. So delegating the decision process, letting the decision being made there where the knowledge, the know-how is, is a very important thing to do. That's the first decision you have to make, that you don't make the decision. The decision yourself. to delegate. Yes, that you don't make all decisions yourself. That's one thing you have to learn. And the second thing is trust. You've got to trust that these people make the right decisions. And the third part is you have to understand. You have to understand that they're not going to make the right decision every time either, just like you're not going to make the right decision. So mistakes and failures are part of the process. If you don't have an understanding for that in your decision process, you're making a mistake as well. Or it might not be the decision the way you would make it, but it's still a good decision. There are a lot of decisions made in our organization where I would not make the same decision. In the same way. In the same way. Right. That, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we have specialists that are hopefully making better decisions than I do. And once in a while, my opinion is second to that of uh, one of my other colleagues on our executive board. It's not always my decision, and very often I have to convince them, or they convince me, or we convince somebody else to do something differently, or we follow them. That's part of the process of exchanging and being a team. In a team, there's not just one player. Everybody's out on the field, and at some point in time, you decide who throws the ball. And I'm not good at sports, so I shouldn't use those kind of things. <laughs> Talk to me about how you walk through triangulation and gathering data to make decisions. Because you, you reference that you, you're going to gather and gather, then you're just going to make a decision, and that's the way it's going to be. Well, first of all, uh, don't lose too much time making decisions. There will be never the perfect moment where you have everything you need to make the right decision. It just isn't there. There's always more information that you can collect. And not making a decision is worse 
than making a slightly wrong decision. And I want to illustrate that a little bit. If I just stand here and don't make a decision, I'm never going to make it back to the end of that room. But if I make a slight, slight wrong decision, I'm going towards that exit side. I'm still going in the right direction, and I can correct it to get back to that pole in the middle of the room. But if I just sit here and do nothing, I'm going nowhere. And if you're at a major part of the organization where you stop everything by not making a decision, your whole organization is not moving. Or your whole department is not moving. Or your small team is not moving. So making decisions and not waiting until that perfect time until you think you have everything, because you'll never have everything you need. There'll always be some more information you can gather. There's always going to be one additional person you can ask. There's always be one additional uh, institution you can consult. At some time, enough is enough. And that's experience where you say, I think I've got enough to make the right decision now. Most of the time, it's right, hopefully. How does your executive team, the team around you, how do they um, experience you? If we, we brought them up, Carol, what would they say about you? Gosh, hopefully I wouldn't be honest. Uh, but, no, um, to be serious, uh, my team were not only colleagues, were friends. We all worked together quite a long time. We trust each other. Uh, we work with each other. We laugh with each other. We solve problems with each other. And we like to do stuff with each other. Um, so I think you would say we have a very collegial forum. But there's no mistake. The buck stops with me. I have a final decision. When there's a controversy and we can't agree, the last word is with me. And that's the respect that I have and get from my team at any time. And that has never been questioned. Uh, that doesn't mean that they won't convince me, but once I've made a decision, I'm not questioned on that. And uh, that makes it easy. But most of the decisions, my team, each of them on our executive board, make more decisions in the organization than I do. Uh, and that's the delegation I'm talking about. These are all top-notch executives, the best of their class in what they do. Am I going to tell Bruce Hugel what to do in the balance sheet and what, what reserves to build up? and uh, uh, what, what ratios to build and what to do in his controlling department, or I'm going to tell Rob Albert uh, what marketing themes are the ones that we're supposed to be next year, which shows are we going to, or Joe Gr I couldn't sell the doctor a, a, a syringe for nothing. Uh, that's what Joe Grisbo does so much better than I do. So I have these specialists that we don't question, we work together. Is that the clarity? You talked about clarity before. How critical that is, clarity in decision making, clarity in vision. Is that where that comes from, Carol? Well, I would think so. I mean, first of all, everybody knows where the boss is and where the decision is made. That, that's one, one important, right. where, where it stops, where you get an answer if you need an answer. That's one thing. But we have a clear, clear cut distinction in our responsibilities, and that's also important for everybody if that's what you mean, Steve. So, that, so there's clarity in roles, there's clarity of who owns what, there's clarity in accountability. There will always be, uh, you know, some kind of uh, areas that are not that clear, but that's where you work together. Right? Yeah. Are there moments where you sit back and are just inspired by your people? What, what inspires you in your organization? It, <laughs> are yes, they're, I'm regularly inspired. Yeah by my group. We sit together every two weeks and we're in meetings and where people respond to their problems, their issues. At the moment, a lot of opportunities that we have. And it's inspirational to see that when I see that this new product is coming out and the program that we put together uh, for it, or to hear when Joe Grispo says that we just, you know, how did we convince this one large integrated health network uh, to convert to b bronze products? how the team did that together with our enterprise system, as we call it. Uh, and uh, the same thing goes when we're setting our targets financially. Inspirational cooperation is part of our concept, I would say. I would never have said it like that, but if I'm asked like that, that would be my response. Are you conscious of how you motivate, shape, and inspire others? Or is it just a natural extension of who you are? Uh, no, I think I, motiv I try to motivate people intentionally. Uh, I want them to feel comfortable around me. I want people to have fun around me. I laugh more definitely than I yell. 
That'd yeah. probably be yeah. a 20 to 1 ratio, I hope, if it's even that bad. Um, I enjoy working with people and I want everybody to feel comfortable around because some of you have the opportunity to walk up. I like to know and get to know people. Can you define leadership? What is a great leader to you? Example. The example. 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 In every way. Don't, don't, in treating people the right way. In demonstrating and in, 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 in standing for the company uh, in the right way. Uh, working hard, uh, having the right ethics, uh, treating people the right way, standing in front of customers and being an example for everybody else uh, as, you, uh, as you represent your organization. There's so much to it, uh, I wouldn't even know where to stop. What's the most difficult thing you've had to do as a leader? Always firing people. Walk me through that. Um, it hurts. Every time you let somebody go, it hurts. Uh, it goes, goes to me every time. And yet, I have never let anybody go that shouldn't have been left gone. And what I've told a lot of people, and during my career I've had to let a lot go, you're mad at me today, but you're going to be appreciative of me tomorrow. And why? The most reason you let someone go is because they're not doing well in their job. Maybe not a fit. They don't have the talent. Right. It's not a fit. They can't work with the team, whatever. But they're uncomfortable too. They're not succeeding in what they're doing. After more, most people that you let go are hurting in their job. They're in the wrong job. But they have talents, and they have opportunities. And letting them go out of an opportunity which is torturing them themselves, tearing them apart, and leading them and let them go on to find something that's going to be better and more satisfying for them in their life is the right thing to do. So you don't always just fire people because they don't fit to the company. You also do something for them. And I've had people after years call me, or if I met them and said, you know, I remember when you said that, and it was absolutely true. I was uncomfortable, I was tortured, I couldn't sleep at night. But now I'm in a job that I love, and I'm doing well, and I've done well. Uh, and those are the good moments yeah, that absolutely. you have after that. Absolutely. You would walk me through, there was a moment in your journey, in Ebron, where there was a little bit of a down cycle and there was some angst around what was going to happen. You had, a, it wasn't quite a turnaround, but it had that, that vibe. And walk me through what you did and that experience of going through that. Well, it was a turnaround, all right. <coughs> when I came over here, we bought a company. Uh, when I came over here, B. Brown was 200 million. Now, again, this year will be one and a half billion. So it's been quite a nice ride. And uh, one of the reasons for that growth is that we took over a company in California, which was very troubled. And during the due diligence process, we did not recognize how troubled this company was. Our due diligence team just didn't do their job. We bought a rotten apple, and we bet our future on it. And it was beyond the financials, I'm assuming. It was, in every, if it, was, it was a management issue. It was a morale. It was an ethical issue. It was a financial issue. It was a, there were so many issues. Uh, I could go on and on. Yeah. Everything. This was a real turnaround situation. We had to take over a company which was larger than the one that bought. The, bought the, the, the company we bought was larger. We had to take over and turn that around. And that was a, there were many nights that I did not sleep during those three years. Those first three years were very tough. And uh, first time in my life that I lost weight working. I wish that would happen again, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, not, not in the same way. But uh, that was a horrible time. Uh, where we had to work very hard, day and night, little reward, a lot of work. And by the way, that's also tough times, little rewards, a lot of work. Not good times, not so much work, great rewards. You always have to work towards the good times, but you're always going to have to go through valleys of those rough ones. And that was my experience that I needed. I think in my career, everything was just 
jolly. It was just, everything was just going perfect. And for the first time in my career that everything was going perfect, I didn't know what not having success meant. And I run right into this huge problem where every time I flew to Germany to a supervisory board meeting, which I do every four months, I'm every three weeks in Germany, but every four months the supervisory board meeting, which represents the shareholders, I thought I'd come back without a job. Three years in a row. Not a real good situation to sleep on. Uh, but we got through it, we turned it around, and uh, this team was a major part of it. So it's really cool. So how does that shape you? Because there's a, there's a, a real view about, it's easy to lead when things are easy, right? It's yeah. very difficult, and you don't grow with that. It's very difficult to lead. You, you grow tremendously, personally and professionally, through very, very difficult times, particularly turnarounds. What did you learn about yourself through that difficult moment? What did I learn about myself? Probably that I'm able to build teams, mm -hmm. because that was truly a team building effort. Uh, to cut out teams, apart team members that didn't belong. I've never been that consequent as I had before in, uh, in, in changing the teams and putting the right teams together. Um, I learned not to be that scared of problems anymore. I learned that problems are solvable. Find the problems. Find something. them and, and that they're solvable. Put the right people on them. And your problem could be how big it ever is. It's always solvable. At least that's been, that's what I learned out of that experience. And so that your first instinct is the people part of it tends to be where the problem is first. The force of financial part, fix the people part. When I say the company is all about the people, people, I mean all about the people. There wasn't a machine and there wasn't a consultant and there wasn't uh, any book that could have helped me in this concept. It was only the right thing was the team and the people I was working with that was gonna get, get us out of that trouble. Did you replace most of that team? Hardly anybody's left. Really? Mm -hmm. And now your new, your new team came in and the culture, how did you blend those two cultures? Now the Beyond team, there are still people left. Right. But right. from the acquired, no, the, the, the acquired the company, hardly anybody's left. Right. We have a lot of students here, undergrads, Graduate students, well. folks who are, you know, going into the world for the first job. Do you have any advice that you could offer, offer our folks? Things to think about. Well, first of all, education is important, and it really is. Uh, that's why you're here. I probably don't have to emphasize that. And good grades are important to get through the door. How important grades are after you got the job is probably not going to be that important. But one thing is, I truly believe is important. Hard working is part of the success story. And if you really want to be successful, you have to put a lot of work into it. It's not going to come. Don't let anybody tell you that uh, you can uh, get to the top or can do a career without hard work. It is truly part of it. Be disciplined to do it. Don't neglect your family, your friends. Don't forget to have fun on the way. All my life, one thing I've never forgotten is to have fun. That is a good part, because that shakes off the stress and everything you live with. Working hard, don't forget to have fun, take your goals serious, and be good to other people. That's my concept, it worked for me. I hope it works for you, if that's the way you want to go. Are you open to questions? Absolutely. So let's throw it open to the audience, and if you folks have some questions, we have Lena and a couple others around with some microphones. And if you have questions for, for Carol, that'd be great. And I truly appreciate dialogue. I really do. So don't be hesitant. There's no such thing as a, not a good question. Thanks. Carol, I just want to, uh, my name's Eric. I'm in the MBA program, but I just want to tie into Steve's question. I think it's a great one and a great road. So a lot of the, a lot of the younger folks in undergrad will be going to their first interviews and having their first interactions obviously now with the CEO most likely, but any top tips or questions that, that you would look for or insights that you could give to the younger folks here on their first foray? It's been quite a while since I've done entry level interviews to be honest. Uh, but I've seen my son go through the experience recently. I've seen my, uh, my nephew just go through it. Uh, so. The next generation of newborns are right there, so I'm pretty near to it, I think. And one thing I can say for sure is be yourself. Don't try to fool anybody. Don't try to 
make out of your something that you would act naturally, be the person you are, uh, be confident. Be confident in what you are, because you're not going to be anything else. That has definitely worked for me very well. Number two, get as many interviews as you can. At the end of the process, when I was looking for my first job, I was an interview profi. I was a professional in interviews. I mean, I felt so comfortable going into those interviews. I'd done it so many times that at the end, I knew how the interview went for myself, and I knew what was expected of me. That'd be another thing. Don't shy. Take those interview opportunities whenever you can. I don't know how much more I can tell you. There are so many different situations and so many different people here. It'd be hard to give you much more advice beyond that. Is that a little bit helpful? Sure. Other questions? Now, I'm not that intimidating, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, my name is Corey Metz. I'm in the MBA program as well. Uh, the key theme of people being the key to success. How do you measure the engagement or the, the happiness of the people in your organization? Are there any key topics that, that you would Employer, well, first of all, we do employee surveys regularly. So we try to measure the temperature of the employee base by that. Um, that's one way uh, of doing it. The success of your teams is another way. If everybody, if the company's doing well and everybody's going well, and you probably have a team that's doing well and is feeling comfortable in uh, what they're doing. We also have evaluation processes. Uh, we have uh, every year. Uh, you have at least two meetings with your boss, uh, and which you look at your goals, respond to your goals. We have an evaluation process that everybody has to go through and gets their feedbacks and gives their feedbacks. It's uh, a uh, part from survey to reporting to discussions uh, and documented. We try to make that as transparent as possible. I don't, I, we're far away from perfect. But those are the ways that we try to do it and find out how uh, our employee base is feeling and doing. Carol, are you aware of the corporate mood and attitude? How conscious of you are you of that? It's it ebbs and flows. It's hard to say. Uh, you know, I sit 12th Avenue, um, where the headquarters is. Uh, there are about 350 people in that building. The majority of the people are all in other places. Right. So I'm not quite sure. How, if I could honestly say I've got a good feeling how it goes everywhere. I'm over in the factory a lot. People wave at me. Uh, they don't look down on the floor when I pass by them, as I've seen in other factories happen. Uh, that doesn't happen at Bebron, uh, and I try to do everything I can. Uh, I speak in front of the employees a couple of times a year. We also open for a question and answer session. We have a workman's council where uh, I participate. Unfortunately, I haven't made the last meetings, uh, but I try to. So I try to stay as near as I can to the many folks we have, and I can only encourage everybody else to do that. Uh, if I really want to know what's going on, I call Mark Pesavento and say, Mark, what's going on? That's our director of labor relations, and his job is to keep his ears to the ground and talk to people and get their feedback. And as Pedro, right next to him, is, is uh, the HR representative in that factory who does the same thing. So we have, very, we have a lot of mechanisms to try to know what's going on and try to know if something's going wrong and if we have something to work on to repair. But of course, we also know what's going right. We want to know what's going right. Absolutely, absolutely. Other questions? Please. I'm Dan Troya. Um, I'm the current employee of Ebron. Yeah, you're the one in Ann Dusenberry's office right now, right? Yes. Yeah, I see. I recognize him. Yeah. Um, where do you see Ebron by the year 2020? 2020, I see B broad, uh, nearly doubling its size by then, uh, if everything goes well. Uh, we have an Im incredible opportunities right now through, uh, um, through things that have happened in our industry, particularly through our competitors goofing up. So at the moment, all we're doing is building up capacity to take, uh, take uh, advantage of those opportunities. Uh, we think we can take uh, market leadership positions in several areas that we don't have right now. So uh, if, 
you want to apply to be Ron, it's probably a good thing to do in the next it's couple time, of years. Right? Yeah, it's a good it's thing a good to do. Time. It really is. Uh, be Ron is on a good ride right now. We're doing very well, and uh, I'm very optimistic about the future. Very, very optimistic. And I'm not just saying that. There have been times five years ago I wouldn't have been as enthusiastic as I am today. Well, what has changed in that five years? Well, first of all, the group are, we've gone on out of a monopolistic purchasing situation, which has been in our industry, the group purchasing organization. They gave all IV solutions to one company and all IV sets to another and uh, all these widgets to that company. And that's <coughs> They've gone away from that monopolistic system and opened up the doors for B. Braun as a small player at that time who weren't able to get. That's all been opening up. Now you've heard or haven't heard about drug shortages and other things where our competitors have kind of made major mistakes where the, where the uh, big group purchasing organizations can't wait uh, to give B. Braun the opportunity to step up. So we're increasing capacity in now in all these areas. So a lot of good things happening. We've got a lot of new products coming out. We've got new factories coming on uh, of products that people can't wait for. So to be honest, I, it's pretty good to be me right now. Yeah, it's, uh, I won't say. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, here please. My name is Rajay uh, The cost of pharmaceuticals and medical products has been excessively high. And the research and development contribution from the pharmaceutical the budget. So when you open the discussion and you said, you know, there's a human being at the end of the product that you convey that to the employees, how do you see this in terms of corporate social responsibility, escalating cost of pharmaceuticals, or what B. Brown would do to tame it? Well, I hate to admit this, but we're not on the high side of the prices, we're on the low side of the prices. We make mostly basic products. Not that we don't have proprietary products, but you take, for example, an IV solution, which is a bag of saline water, which has to be sterilized and is pyrogen free and has to be tested and goes through a hard process, and you get one dollar for it. It's less than a bottle of Perrier. Or I'll give you ten syringes for what is it? Ten syringes, what do they cost you? Nine cents or something like that? Not yet. Uh, not yet, but we're getting there. Uh, there are a lot of, we are not on that high end. We are actually a basic provider. We make most of our products of the milk and butter of the medical device industry. When it comes to the other end, when you're talking about these proprietary products, uh, and we have some of them, like a drug-eluting balloon or, or drug-eluting stents, <coughs> where we get up into the thousands of dollars, or implants where you pay thousands of dollars. Where's the ethical question? Are you asking me to take care of that patient who can't afford it? Is that the question you're asking me? Uh, well, we are a proponent and a supporter of general <coughs> health care insurance for a broad population. I've never understood, and will never understand, that the richest nation in the world cannot provide health care insurance for its complete population. I've lived half of my life in this country and half of my life I've lived in, the, in Germany. In Germany, everybody has health care. No matter how much you make, no matter what you do, and no matter if you do nothing, you have health insurance. And that's the way it has to be. We have to take care of our fellow man. So the problem is not in the cost of the, of the, the, the it might be to some certain degree if there's Godgers out there or something. But in principle, the problem is not what we get for our products. Because if you look at the medical device industry and the pharmaceutical industry, we don't have any higher margins, profitability margins, in any other industry. And we need that money to reinvest in R&D to stay innovative and take care of the cures tomorrow that you expect for us to take care of tomorrow. So the problem, from my perspective, is getting insurance to everybody and making sure that everybody has access to care and to the products they need for that care versus what the product costs. That might have to be regulated, and if they're godgers out there, got to take care of them, but most of them are not. Most companies in the medical device industry just have the same margins or even lower than in other industries. So there's nothing there that we're, we're not the, you know, we're not the golden pond that we just go to and drink out of every day. So is that kind of a, an answer? Right, I mean, I, I, I might be a physician, I've used a lot of people products. Well, I'm glad to hear that, sir. But having said that, you know, when uh, a joining company shows up on CBS 60 Minutes and cut the price of the uh, oncology drug from 6000 to $3,000 overnight, I, 
just have trouble conceptualizing that, that the price could drop 50% after it becomes a public knowledge that it's uh, overpriced. Well, that's the patent situation we have in this country. We've decided, and the, practically the complete Western society has decided, okay, if you share your knowledge with us and do not keep it your secret, we'll let you patent that and we'll give you a monopoly for a certain part of time until you can, so that you can recuperate your, 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 your reward and maybe your investments. Uh, but after that, it's available to everybody. And that's what happens with these generic products and they don't even drop, they don't even drop half. They drop sometimes by 90%. From that day they go off patent protection till the day that they uh, uh, lose it, it, that's what happens. But only during that period do you have time to get back sometimes billions of dollars that you had to put in making that drug. Alone what clinical nutrition, uh, clinical trials, and you would know that as a physician, what clinical trials cost today. For the easiest product, $10 million is nothing. For the easiest drug, $100 million is nothing nowadays just to get the clinical trial. That doesn't mean the R&D you did before and all the time and all the people you've employed just to go through clinical trials and get the approval. You have a very limited time to get a return on your investment and get that money back. That's what happens then. As long as it's on patent, you have a monopoly. You have a monopoly, you take hopefully enough that you get a de decent return on your uh, investment uh, plus a uh, relatively good product margin. Hopefully you're not overdoing it. I don't see that necessarily happening. Ken, what, why is it that another industry is tech on a real fashion? That we don't quite have that same uh, consumer anger over them making profit, significant profits. But yet, when we look at medical, we get upset about that, but the profit margin may be actually lower. Well, let's take it. A bicycle or a car, not everybody needs. And not everybody needs a drone flying around in their backyard or a, a, a bass fishing boat uh, on the lake behind them. Uh, whereas medical products, again, there is an ethical aspect to it. Uh, we are, we, we, we do this to save lives, we have the obligation to save right. lives. Right. I can understand that that is seen somewhat different than something that's not necessary. Um, I, I feel that responsibility myself. Yeah. Uh, and as I told you, I feel good about it. With that feeling good about it, also comes the responsibility to do well. And that's why questions like that are absolutely legitimate, and I'll take that up at any good time. And if you look at our, our profit margins, our profit margins are definitely below the cigarette industry and the car industry and a lot of other industries that will be out there. It's not that we're making crazy money. Other questions? Yeah, here. Sorry, it's the last one for me, but it's, it's related, so I want to keep it together. So the, uh, I know you've been a vocal, um, I guess, opponent of the medical device tax. Is that in the same vein where you have to you get hit with that once and then it goes away for the people down the road that are introducing a knockoff or imitation of some proprietary? No, it doesn't work that way. Um, the, the medical device tax is is a totally different. It's like a sales tax. Uh, it's a it's a it's an excise tax. It everybody pays it. If my competitor, this has nothing to do with proprietary. If I sell a widget for one hundred dollars, I have to pay two point three dollar two point three percent or two point $2.30 tax on it. That's just how it goes. That's supposed to be due to, to uh, finance the Affordable Care Act, and it's a stupid tax. Uh, again, it's an excise tax, by the way. Uh, you, you know the concept of excise taxes? Tobacco tax is an excise tax. Alcohol tax is an excise tax. You put taxes on stuff that you don't want people to use. It's called, also called the sin tax. You want, don't want people to use, yet if they use it, you want to make good money off of it. Um, so it's a, it's a stupid tax. It's hurting, hurting our industry. Uh, and uh, even if you're not profitable, even if you're not profitable, you have to pay this tax. And the new, newest, uh, gosh, did you push my button? Uh, Ernst & Young just put out a study showing that this device tax in the last two years has increased the federal tax burden for the medical device industry by 29%. If I increase your tax burden or that of your parents or that of the companies you work for by 29%, what does that do? That takes monies away that you need to run your company. So bad tax, bad idea, and it hits everybody. 
uh, no matter if they're profitable or not, just is, a stupid tax. Is that still the main impediment for moving to Center Valley with the property that people are on as well? That is definitely, that building would have cost $25 million, and that's what I paid the last two years. That's how easy it is. Right. Didn't let anybody go, though. Nobody. But others did. Stryker let 5,000 people go. Our industry has lost 19,000 jobs in the last two years and has foregone to hire another 19. Those are the jobs that you might be looking for and they're not there tomorrow. This tax will go down though, I'm pretty confident. They call me Mr. Medical Device Tax. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, I think you, I, I, I've got you, sir. sir. Yes, uh, my name is Ken Telford, uh, <coughs> MBA graduate from here at DCL, and I'm also an employee at uh, B. Brown Medical. Uh, as an employee, it was very nice to hear that your people are the greatest asset that you have at Vibra. Yeah. Uh, and in that vein, I'd like to know, what's your take on succession planning? Succe well, important. We have a system where we evaluate every employee, at least up a certain managerial level. And the evaluation isn't A, B, C, or D. It's your talent. Are you a diamond in the rough? Are you a solid performer, solid professional, creative innovator? We put you in those kind of boxes. Uh, and uh, all of those show certain career paths. And uh, we discuss them and uh, evaluate the folks. And then we have for every position, managerial position, we put potential successors there, how far they are. How long we would think they would need? Are they ready today? Will they be ready in three years? Want to say we do it systematically, we take it very seriously. Because if we don't have the right people in place tomorrow, our company might not be secure the day after that. So we do take succession planning very, very serious, and I would encourage you to do that. I've got two more, but I promised you first, and then you, sir, okay? Do you mind if I take over asking? Go, I'll call you. You got any favorites? I'm frankly okay. offended okay. at this point, Carol. No, uh, <laughs> sir, please. Yes, thank, thank you, Carol. Thank you for being here tonight. I, I'm Dave Gilf, I run the MBA program here. Kind of a follow-on question to my friend uh, Kendall up there uh, about people uh, being your most uh, valued asset and, and tied into your own strong work ethic and your success, working six, seven hours a day. Uh, and people that may want to emulate you and try to climb upwards and, and so on by those same kinds of values, you know, what kind of programs, plans, or initiatives do you have or would you like to have in place that kind of prevent people from burning out in that, in that quest or having a slightly better, you know, work-life balance? <coughs> work-life balance is... I'm not good enough in that to talk about it. I'm trying to give everybody the opportunity to do so, but don't fool yourself. If you want to get up into the executive level, you're going to sacrifice the work-life balance part of your life. I don't know any executive in the higher ranks that has a 40-day week, a 40-hour week. It just doesn't exist. So, and that's why I'm telling. I try to tell you something different, but I can't. And I don't know anybody who says, you know, I'm a CEO or I'm a senior vice president or even a vice president and the 40-hour 40 work, 40 workday works for me. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make family work and that is important, giving up time and giving you the opportunity to take off and to take time off, work balance, letting you work at home. We're trying to find new ways uh, to, to, to maintain the talent and yet not to get people burned out. When we start, we, we watch for burnout syndromes and we go after them if we see that. Best way is give people a good job that they love to do, uh, that they can handle and you won't get there. But it happens, we, it, it happens all the time. And we've gotta watch out that that doesn't happen. How to work with your families, it's not my area of expertise. You'd have to have Chris Donick in here or HR folks. Honestly, if I get into work-life balance, I'm, I'm out of my comfort zone. But we have a lot of people working on it. It's just not my thing, because I love so much what I do. I'm just so happy I can't stop doing it. That's a real problem, isn't it? <laughs> By the way, my wife's happy about it. She's back there. That's that gorgeous lady back there. She's here today listening as well. 
uh, trying to find out if I have any secrets that I would divulge. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, it, I'm with her now 40 years. It works. So somehow I've found a way, we found a way, despite my workload, to have a, a reasonable work-life balance. It, it, it works that way. Is that what it, sir? Uh, yeah, what was uh, your like, hardest transition of when you like, began your career in the folk world? That was probably going from lawyer to operating manager. Nobody trained me for it. They just threw me into it. And that taught me one thing, that uh, most of, if not all, but most of the things you can do, you can do intuitively. And you just have to have the guts to do it. And, and, and believe in yourself, and, and trust in yourself, and trust in your team, and never, Never hesitate to ask. That's why not asking at this opportunity, not, not asking here, is not ask here. This is an opportunity. You're not going to embarrass yourself. You definitely, you might embarrass me, but who cares if you embarrass me, right? But uh, that's what it was. Ask, trusting myself, having the energy, uh, not being scared to ask people, and looking for support wherever I got it. That was a hard transition. And again, taking over a very troubled company, I thought, first of all, I thought it was me. I thought this was all going down, spiraling down, because I didn't know what I was doing, just to find out I was doing the right things intuitively with my team, and we were going the right direction. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Miriam. I'm a junior here at the sales, and my question is about company culture. So throughout the discussion, I've heard that impacting lives is one of the things that the company kind of revolves around. So my question is, if you have to describe the company culture in a couple words, what would those words be? And what are you doing to instill it, instill that culture throughout the whole company, and how are you keeping it strong? I've got one word for you, family. We feel a little bit like family. That's at least what we want to be. That's what our owner family wants us to be. In Germany, we call ourselves Braunians. Doesn't translate good in Germany, but it's, it's you know, we're like, uh, uh, I don't know. So, Braunianer, it doesn't translate well. But we call ourselves in Germany Braunianer, and we're very, very proud of that. So this family approach, this approach of belonging together, being able to trust everybody around you, and like in every family, there's trouble. And there's two siblings that don't get along. And once in a while, the has to grab in and, 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 and shake some heads. But family is, if I had to use one word, that would be it. But taking care of each other, trying to put the right people in the right place, being proud of what we do, and always keeping our patients in mind, that's kind of the culture that we want. Does that help you a bit in that direction? Very well. Thank you. Karen, uh, uh, my name's Dan, I'm a senior here at DeSales. You said that the Gambit Center and DeSales was a perfect partnership for Braun. Uh, can you touch on that a little bit and what makes it so perfect and how your company profits from the partnership? Most of our products are being used by nurses today. We have a lot of physician-only products, but if you take an IV set, and if you take a syringe, and if you take an IV solution, you take extension sets, an IV catheter, uh, you take wound care products, uh, you take an irrigation bottle. These are things that are being used by nurses. The IV pumps that are up there. And a lot of the instruments that we've provided uh, in this institution being used by nurses. So it's a natural that early in the educational process, you get in touch with our products and understand how they're used. And we get feedback from you how you use them. Next to that, you have a huge investment here, your school does, right? I mean, this building and the educational facilities are first class. You can't go anywhere better. It's not better than that uh, physician ward uh, uh, that you have up there, uh, the emergency room, uh, the delivery ward, uh, the cadaver la laboratory that you have downstairs. You, have, you are blessed to have one of the best facilities in this country, <coughs> if not the world. And that costs a lot of money. Well, when you're not using it, we are. We bring customers here. We do education with our sales reps here. We bring our marketing folks here to look and try our products. And at that time, we're using it. We're using an investment, and uh, we're 
paying or there's some kind of consideration from our part from you that is using that assets. Is, that's truly a win-win in every aspect. So, uh, and, and getting to work with your educators. There are new ideas coming from your educators what we could do better. Because they hear from the students, oh gosh, you, you are a lot of smart people here. And you come up with ideas while you're using our products. Gosh, that software and that pump, if you just do this, that could not have happened. Or if you tell us that this instrument or this ID set might be better the other way around with your, with your experience, that's why you're using it. Very important feedback for us. There's not a situation where there's no win-win. Is that clear enough? Nope. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Sure. All right. Uh, you mentioned uh, how during that position in that company in California, I believe, yeah. and they do so hot. Um, and during these times, you had a, a tough time, and you traveled to Germany every four months, I believe. Every three weeks. Every, every three weeks, mm -hmm. you weren't sure if you'd come back to the job. Um, oh, that was the supervisory board. Every four months, yes, that meeting. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, you're asked to lead a company. How did you come back and uh, show this company, hey, listen, right now we're going through a tough time with this acquisition, but the best times are ahead. How did you make them feel confident? That was a, a very, very hard task. And with my limited operational experience was truly probably the largest challenge during that time was to convince the supervisory board, a group of very experienced managers uh, and uh, shareholders, uh, that I was the right guy to do this. And my team gave me the right stuff in my hand and the right answers to show them that I had identified the problems with my team, that we were working on these problems, and that we probably had the right solutions to those problems. And I had to truly do that every four months. It's not getting better yet, but it will, because this is the issue. This is how we are going to resolve it, and this is when it will be resolved. Bear with me. And that bear with me went three months. And God bless, I had a, a, a supervisory board who knew of my, of my inexperience, understood it, knew though that I had a team behind me with experience that were feeding me with knowledge that gave them the confidence that with that team I could do it. Not alone, but with that team I could do it together. Showing you again that it's all about the team and not about a single player. I was ultimately responsible as the CEO, but I wasn't the one who was going to resolve the issues. It was the team behind me that made me strong. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, hi, my name is John Bayou. I'm a uh, senior here in the business department. Um, I actually had the opportunity to intern at B. Braun this past summer under Hanny McHale in corporate operations. Control. Good man. Uh, yeah, it was a you great, like numbers great though. Yeah, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, I was a financial analyst. So. Yeah. Um, my question comes, I guess, piggyback, piggybacking off of Dan Troy's earlier in terms of growth. Um, some of my projects this summer, I got to look at some of our competitors um, in the industry in general. You mentioned that in the next five or so years, uh, B. Braun should be almost doubling in size. Do you think there is any aspect of the medical device industry or the healthcare industry that we're not uh, currently hitting um, that you think b Brown might be getting into <coughs> in the next decade or so? Other areas outside of what we are? Uh, within the current medical device industry now in terms of products or machines? I don't think that we have to expand the breadth of our product range. I think with what we have, that, that doesn't mean we don't need innovative products within our product range. But in, I don't think we need an expansion of the product range. We are well positioned. If not, we're too broad at all. We have to focus on what we have right now. And that growth program that I just talked about is more or less counting on areas that we were. Some new injectable drugs, that's a little bit of a new area, but it's not out of what we're doing right now, expanding into those areas. But more or less, it's uh, just taking market share from others and expanding with better products in a market that deserves it. Carol. Was that kind of right, guys? Perfect. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Carol, thank you for spending the evening with us. We're so grateful. And thanks to your team for coming as well. Uh, for everybody, we do have uh, food and some good conversation out in the, the foyer above. And Carol will be available and his entire executive team that's here, a chance to spend some time and, and talk with them and ask them <coughs> questions. And once again, thank you so much for spending time with us. This it's was really great. Thank you for having me. I truly appreciate it.